Hi, welcome. My name is Kimia Grigoriev, and I'm the founder and president of HESPSS. Before we get started, I just wanted to take a moment to thank you all for being here, and I also want to thank our amazing team for working tirelessly to put this event together. I also want to thank Dr. Michael Levin for agreeing to do this event with us. We are incredibly honored and could not thank you enough. It is my honor to introduce Dr. Max Krasnow. He is a highly respected and esteemed professor, speaker, researcher, and we're fortunate enough to call him our wonderful faculty advisor for the Harvard Extension School Psychology Student Society. We are truly honored to have his invaluable guidance, support, and advice. With a decade of teaching experience at Harvard in the College, Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, and in the Extension School, his expertise is vast and invaluable. Prior to joining Harvard, Dr. Krasnow earned his PhD in psychology from UC Santa Barbara with a focus on developmental and evolutionary psychology. His background and expertise make his insights incredibly valuable to our society and its members. Additionally, Dr. Krasnow is known for consistently going above and beyond for his students to ensure their academic and professional success. Please help me welcome Dr. Max Krasnow. Thank you, Kimia. So it is my privilege today to introduce Dr. Michael Levin. Michael Levin attended Tufts University, where he received dual bachelor's degrees in computer science and biology. He earned a PhD from Harvard University for the first characterization of the molecular genetic mechanisms that allow embryos to form a consistently left-right asymmetric body structure in a universe that doesn't distinguish that for them. This work is on nature's list of 100 milestones in developmental biology of the past century. He's the Distinguished Professor and Vannevar Bush Chair in the Department of Biology at Tufts University, where he also serves as the Director of the Center for Regenerative, Regenerative and Developmental Biology. After a career as a software engineer in the field of scientific computing, Professor Levin earned his bachelor's in both computer science and biology, like I said, before coming to Harvard for his PhD. Later in his postdoc and up to his current positions, He's won numerous other awards that I won't take more time to mention, nor the journals that he serves as editor for, and so on and so on, because I'm too excited to get straight to letting us all hear from him. Let me present to you now Dr. Michael Levin, who will be telling us all about bioelectricity, body intelligence, and the future of regenerative, regenerative medicine. And I'll say that right one of these days. All right, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to share some ideas with you. Um, I hope you will see uh, how all of this uh, relates to psychology because I think uh, I think it really does. So uh, if uh, you would like um, uh, to find any of the materials, the software, the, the papers, every, everything is at, uh, at this website, please feel free to um, get in touch with me afterwards if you have questions or ideas or, or anything else. So I wanna start off with this idea that um, all of us made this amazing journey from quote unquote, just physics to cognition. We were all at one point um, uh, a, an unfertilized oocyte. So uh, a, a little blob of chemistry and physics. And then through this amazing process of embryonic development, we became one of these complex uh, body structures or in fact, maybe a complex metacognitive human being. And so this, uh, this, this is really important because for, for this reason, I think that developmental biology is maybe one of the most uh, remarkable and magical of all sciences, because there you can see right in front of you, right in front of your eyes, how physics becomes mind. And it's a slow, gradual process. There's no um, special lightning flash that turns, uh, that turns um, a mechanism into, into meaning or anything like that. It happens slowly and gradually. And so, uh, so here we are trying to understand this, uh, the, the, the process and the ramifications um, of that of that process. But, um, and, and often we think, well, uh, okay, so, so we, we undergo this, this journey, but in the end, we are some sort of a, uh, a unified a single intelligence. We're not like these uh, so-called collective intelligences like ants and termites and bee colonies and so on. But um, actually, if we think about it, we are also uh, an interesting kind of collective intelligence because for example, Rene Descartes really liked the pineal gland because he said that in the brain, it's the one structure that isn't duplicated, and so that's, it's fitting that a unified human intelligence, um, in some way, lives in that in that pineal gland. 
But if he had access to good microscopy, what he would have found is that actually there's not one of anything. He would have found that that, that gland is actually uh, full of cells. And if you were to look inside of these cells, you would see something like this. This is this is what's actually inside of uh, in the mo most cells. And this is, of course, is only a, 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 a partial accounting of what's in there. So, so in an important sense, we are all collective intelligences, uh, and and it's very likely that all intelligence is collective intelligence because all intelligence is made of parts of some sort. So this is this is the kind of thing we're made of. Here is a lacrimaria. This is a free living unicellular organism. Uh, what you'll notice here is that there's no brain, there's no nervous system, there are no stem cells. Uh, all of its needs, uh, uh, metabolic, uh, physiological states, uh, 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 anatomical control, all of its needs are handled at the single cell level uh, very, very expertly without, without the need for, for a brain or other cells or anything like that. And so this is the kind of material that we're made of. Uh, it is not where we don't, we don't consist of some sort of passive uh, components. I sometimes give a talk called Why Robots Don't Get Cancer. And the answer is because current technology is largely, um, not exclusively, but largely made at a single scale where the overall machine might be competent and intelligent, but it's usually made of pretty, um, pretty dumb parts that don't have agendas of their own. But that's not true for us. We are made of an agential material because we are made of components with competencies and agendas in various problem spaces. And so that gives rise to a number of interesting uh, biological phenomena. Um, I'm going to just describe a few that that are, are kind of unique and that many people don't often think about um, that will set us up for the next part of the talk. So, so for example, uh, here is a soft-bodied creature uh, which has a brain appropriate to driving a kind of soft-bodied um, uh, kind of soft-bodied embodiment where. Uh, it, it likes uh, particular kinds of leaves and so on. And this creature, which lives in a two-dimensional world of leaves, has to turn into this creature, which is a now hard-bodied uh, kind of system, completely different controller you need for that. Um, it lives in a three-dimensional world, doesn't care about leaves anymore, I mean, it wants nectar, and it has a different brain. And there are uh, data showing that during this process of metamorphosis, which is this remarkable process in which the brain pretty much is dissolved, uh, most of the, the cells are killed off, the connections are broken, uh, and then reassembled into a new kind of brain. And yet memories that the, uh, that the caterpillar forms are retained in the moth or butterfly. And so w w not only is there a very practical question here, which be because we, we don't have any kind of uh, memory medium in our computer technology or anything else that is this robust, where you can basically take it apart and reshuffle all the components and kill off most of it, and then you still have the original information. Not only, not only that, but there's really a very fundamental philosophical question here, and people sometimes ask, uh, what's it like to be a bat or a butterfly or something else? But this is one step further. What's it like to be a caterpillar slowly changing into a butterfly? So this sets us up to start to think about the intersection between uh, between body shape and uh, the shape of our of our minds and our cognitive systems, and the idea that we change not only on an evolutionary time scale but also on an individual time scale. You know, this happens. This amazing transformation happens within the lifetime of this individual. Uh, memories actually can be even even more robust. So this is a creature known as a, a planarian flatworm. And I'll talk much more about this in a few minutes. But one of the things that uh, that is is known is that yeah, these guys regenerate. So you can cut them into pieces. Each piece makes a perfect little worm. And what was shown in the 60s, and, and this was um, James McConnell found this. Um, he got a lot of uh, flack over it, but he was actually right. We, uh, we confirmed this with modern uh, techniques about 10 years ago. If you take this planarian and you train them, for example, to recognize that this bumpy region in this uh, dish uh, contains food, as so you feed them on this bumpy uh, kind of region, uh, you can then amputate the brain and, the, in fact, the whole head. The tail will sit there doing nothing for about eight to 10 days, and they slowly regrow a new head. And uh, then you can find out that the re uh, resulting worm actually still remembers the original information. So it's a place preference assay, and you can, you can show that they still remember. So uh, kind of a place conditioning uh, paradigm there. And so um, what you see is that, is that memory, first of all, is not necessarily just stored inside the brain, but also can be imprinted onto a new brain by the rest of the tissue. And so now, once again, you have this very fundamental philosophical um, experiment, such as this uh, the malfunctioning transporter, you know, from, from Phil 101, where you have this transporter that makes a copy of you and then erases the original. Uh, but what happens if it fails to erase the original? Which one is the real you? Well, planaria can do this all the time, right? You can cut them up into pieces and all of them have the memories of the original. 
So um, now moving to, uh, to a vertebrate system, uh, that kind of plasticity, we, we showed something interesting in tadpoles, which you'll notice. So this is a tadpole of the frog Xenopus lavis. You'll notice that here's the mouth here, the nostrils, the brain, and the gut, and here's the tail. And so what you'll see is that there are no primary eyes. We prevented those from forming. But what we did do was uh, cause an eye to form on its tail. And when you do this, the eye makes an optic nerve. Well, first of all, the cells are perfectly happy to make an eye, even though they're sitting next to muscle instead of up here next to the brain where they belong. But also, they make this one optic nerve. The optic nerve goes and it synapses onto the spinal cord. It does not go all the way to the brain. And then we can show using this machine that we built that these animals can see. So even though they have a, uh, we can we can train them in, in visual assays. And so even though we've radically changed the sensory motor architecture of this creature with no period of evolutionary adaptation to it, immediately in the first generation, uh, the the um, the animal can use this novel configuration in its adaptive behavior. So so that that plasticity, you know, this this ability to to adjust to novel. Um, uh, novel architectures and, uh, and novel circumstances is really critical, and we're going to we're going to uh, see why. So uh, the 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 what what underlies all of these amazing abilities is uh, in part something we call the multi-scale competency architecture. This is the idea that not only are we this kind of nest of dolls where uh, molecular networks and then subcellular components and then tissues and organs and whole bodies and even uh, swarms of organisms. Not only are we a set of nested dolls structurally, but also functionally. In other words, uh, every, uh, every layer of the of organization has its own competency to solve problems in different spaces. So it's not all about uh, traditional behavior in three-dimensional space of movement. There are also transcriptional spaces, physiological spaces, uh, metabolic spaces and so on. And so the competency of all these different components simultaneously solving these problems and interacting with uh, both, both laterally and with levels above and below is what enables the whole body to have this incredible uh, kind of uh, robustness and, and um, uh, creative problem solving capacities. And, you know, as, as humans, we're, we're very good at detecting intelligence of uh, uh, in, in three-dimensional space, medium-sized objects moving at medium speeds on, on our human time scale through three-dimensional space. And so we see primates and we see crows and, uh, you know, things like that. And, and we, can, we can recognize intelligent behavior. But there are these other spaces that we're really not very good at recognizing. And it's um, towards the end of the talk, I'll show you some tools that we've developed to help us uh, think about this. But I, I firmly believe that uh, the three-dimensional space that we're used to is not privileged in some sense, that, but rather it's uh, it's a it's a construction of our of our uh, sensory motor architecture. And that if we, for example, had a primary perception of our blood chemistry, let's say you could you could feel all the you know, some, some number of, of chemical states in your in your blood, uh, the way that we do with vision and sight and and and, and smell and, and taste and so on. I think we would have no trouble uh, visualizing that we live in a kind of physiological state space, a high dimensional physiological state space. And in particular, we would recognize our uh, our liver, our kidneys, our various organs as navigating that state space on a daily basis and doing very intelligent things to get us through, to across various uh, problems and novel scenarios that come up. So what I'd like to do today is to talk about one, we, we could talk about all of these, there are fascinating examples in, in them all, but I'd like to spend today talking about morphospace, space, which is the space of possible anatomical configurations. It's a kind of a, you know, pick a body structure or in fact the entire body, and you can think about the space of uh, all possible uh, variants of that uh, of that structure and how they topologically relate to each other. So let's 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 talk about this. Um, in order to to talk about that, and I'm I'm in particular I'm going to uh, propose this idea that we can fruitfully think of morphogenesis of of the generation of biological shape as the behavior of a collective intelligence of cells in anatomical morphospace. In other words. Uh, embryonic development, regeneration, cancer suppression, uh, remodeling, metamorphosis, all of these kinds of things are a kind of behavior. They're a kind of behavior of a collective intelligence that navigates that space in the way that uh, uh, we typically think neurons are a collective intelligence that help us navigate three-dimensional space. So let's ask, let's ask this question. Um, uh, here's, here's where we end up in morphospace space as adult humans. Here's a cross-section through a normal human body. Uh, in the torso, look at look at the incredible order, the structures, everything is in the right place, the right uh, size, uh, oriented correctly relative to the right thing. Amazing uh, degrees of order. W where does that order come from? Where is it recorded? And 
Uh, many people at this point would say, well, it's in the DNA, of course, it's in the genome, but we can read genomes now and we know what's in the genome. It's uh, protein sequences. So the tiniest uh, hardware available to every cell. They, the, the genome doesn't have a plan of a, uh, a large scale um, anatomy as far as uh, which side is left, which side is right, how many eyes are you going to have eyes. All of these things have to be constructed on the fly by cells that uh, use the hardware given to them by the genome to make all kinds of computations. And um, this, this structure is no more, uh, quote unquote, in the DNA, any more than the structure of a termite colony is in the termite's DNA or the shape of a spider's web is in the uh, spider's DNA. It's all um, uh, an emergent uh, computational process that requires a lot of um, uh, uh, collective intelligence from the, uh, from, the, from the pieces. And so as workers in regenerative medicine, we would like to know if a piece of this is missing, how do we get the cells to rebuild and repair? Um, uh, for cancer, we might want to know how do they know when to stop building. And as engineers, we'd like to know what else is possible with the, with the cells from the exact same genome. What else are they willing to build if we knew the right signals? And so these are all the kinds of questions that, um, that we're interested in to understand that navigation through morphospace. Now, as we think about what would a, a finished solution in this field look like, you know, what's the end game? When, when can we all go home? Uh, I think it's useful to visualize that, right? What, what, does, what does it look like when it's solved? And I think what it looks like is something we call an anatomical compiler. The idea here is that uh, someday you'll be able to sit in front, of a, uh, in front of a computer and draw the plant or animal that you want. And so you could draw this, this, this schematic of a three-headed flatworm. And so you would draw at the level of anatomy, not, not at the level of molecular pathways or anything like that. And if, and if we had such a thing, if we knew what we were doing, the system would compile our anatomical description into a set of stimuli that would have to be given to specific cells to get them to build whatever we want them to build. Now, uh, this is, uh, this is really important that, that this is not a, th this device would not be a 3D printer. The point isn't to micromanage the position of every cell. The point is to communicate your anatomical goals to the collective intelligence of cells and get them to build. Now, why is this, why is this important? Besides the basic um, kind of uh, uh, importance for, for developmental biology and evolution and so on. Uh, most problems in biomedicine boil down to the control of shape. In other words, if, if we had a way to tell groups of cells what to build, we would simultaneously be able to solve birth defects, traumatic injury, cancer, aging, degenerative disease. All of these things would go away if we had some ability to communicate anatomical goals to cells. Um, now, one, one issue is uh, why don't we have such a thing? I mean, molecular uh, biology and genetics have been around for a long time, amazing progress. Um, why, why, do, why don't we have this yet? Well, I'll just give you a very simple example. So this, is, this, this here is a baby axolotl, and baby axolotls are, uh, have little, little forelegs. This is a uh, tadpole of the frogs, Xenopus lavis. At, the, at, their stage, at this stage, they do not have any legs. One thing we do in our lab is we make frogolotls. So these are a combination of uh, some axolotl embryonic cells, some frog embryonic cells, and you get a frog -alotl. And so now I pose the question, we have the axolotl genome, uh, so that we have the frog genome, so you have all the genomic information. And so now I ask, could you tell me if a frog -alotl is going to have uh, tail, uh, uh, legs or not? And the thing is that we, we can't, we, we have no idea, because while we're pretty good at the molecular machinery, we really do not understand how collectives of cells make decisions. We don't know if frog allotals will have legs. We don't know if they do have legs. We have no, there is no theory that will tell you whether those legs uh, would consist of frog cells or only axolotl cells. These are all completely open questions. So where we are in biomedicine is this. Uh, we're very good at manipulating cells and molecules and we make models like this of which proteins and which genes interact with each other. But what we'd really like to do is to control form and function. And so I'm going to make the claim that where we are in medicine today is roughly where computer science was in the 40s and 50s. And so you can see what she's doing here. She's programming this computer by physically rewiring it. Back in those days, you had to interact with the hardware. That was the only option. And I think uh, today, molecular medicine, so, so CRISPR, genome editing, protein engineering, um, all, all those kinds of things, all these exciting uh, uh, approaches are all focused on the hardware. And I think that uh, really transformative biomedicine is going to appear when we add to this the really uh, critical uh, way to, uh, to understand uh, control and, and communicate with the software of life, or uh, AKA the collective intelligence of cells and their problem-solving abilities. 
So um, when I uh, talk about intelligence, and I'll probably mention that many times in this talk, what I mean is this, 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 this William James definition, which is the ability to reach the same goal by different means. Very interesting definition. It doesn't say anything about brains. It doesn't say any, anything about um, whether you were evolved or engineered or some combination thereof or how you got here. Uh, it focuses on this kind of very cybernetic notion of being able to navigate a space towards a goal and having some degree of competency to do it uh, by, by different different means when when um, when your standard way of going about it is blocked in some way or, or perturbed. So um, so what kind of collective intelligence do these cellular swarms deploy? What do they what what can they do? Well, let's see. Uh, we we know that um, developmental self assembly is very reliable. So uh, most of the time, this uh, single cell will give rise to this amazing three dimensional uh, anatomy, this target morphology. But we know that it's not hardwired because if you cut these, for example, in half, which you don't get two half bodies, you get two perfectly normal monozygotic twins. And so there's this, and, and there are many other, uh, the, the, these types of perturbations that the idea is that, that um, in the system from different starting positions, and so this is a very vastly simplified morphospace space down to sort of two, uh, two axes, you can get from different starting positions, you still manage to get to the same ensemble of goal states corresponding to normal human uh, variations. And in fact, for in, in various ways in development, uh, you, can, you can go around local, uh, local optima, such as this local, local minimum and so on, and still get to where you need to go despite starting off from different positions. So that's interesting. It has, it has some degree of flexibility of, 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 of its surroundings. And uh, this isn't just for embryos. For example, this, this is that axe model I mentioned. These guys regenerate their limbs, their jaws, their, their eyes, their spinal cords, um, portions of the heart and brain. And what you'll see here is that uh, if uh, they lose some part of this limb, uh, and it could be down here, it could be here, it could be up here, anywhere, what they will do is uh, they will rapidly regrow and remake the limb, and then they stop. And that's perhaps the most amazing thing about regeneration, that it knows when to stop. When does it stop? It stops when a correct salamander limb has been completed. So what you have here is a kind of error minimization scheme where, where the system will uh, attempt, despite these kind of injuries and deviations, will attempt to keep to this target morphology. So this idea of anatomical homeostasis, the ability to take action repeatedly to make up for uh, perturbations that push you out of the correct region of morphospace down to this region, they can work their way back. So, um, of course, uh, salamanders and worms aren't the, aren't the only ones that can do this. Um, the human liver is actually highly regenerative. Even the ancient Greeks knew that. I, I have no idea how they knew that, but they did. Um, every year, uh, deer, which are a large adult mammal, they regenerate their, uh, their antlers. So that means bone innervation, skin, uh, up to a centimeter and a half of new bone growth every day. Uh, so, so kind of remarkable regenerative ability as an adult mammal. Uh, and even human children can regenerate their fingertips. So below a certain age, a clean amputation will regrow with, um, you know, cosmetically very, uh, very reasonable results. So uh, one final example, um, this is something that we discovered a few years ago, which is, which is this. Uh, tadpoles, of course, need to become frogs. And in order for a tadpole face to become a frog face, things have to move. So the jaws have to come out, the eyes have to move forward, the nostrils move, everything moves. And it used to be thought, it was assumed that this is some kind of hardwired process. After all, every tadpole looks the same, every frog looks the same. And so if you just, if, if every piece of the head just remembers which direction and, um, and how far to go, then you go from a normal tadpole to a normal frog. So, so that was the assumption. So we decided to test that assumption. And this is really important because as we talk about this field of uh, basal cognition, diverse intelligence, looking at uh, these kind of protocognitive capacities in unfamiliar embodiments, it's very important that we cannot simply make armchair pronouncements about what we think, of, which systems we think have what degree of intelligence. We have to do experiments because it, it, it is often not obvious. So what we did in this particular case is we made what's called Picasso tadpoles. And Picasso tadpoles have everything scrambled. So the eyes on the top of the head, the, the jaws are off to the side, everything is, everything is moved around. And what we found is that these tadpoles make uh, largely perfectly normal frogs because everything moves around from novel uh, positions. Sometimes it actually goes too far and has to come back a little bit. Uh, it, it, it makes these, uh, these movements and then, and then it settles into a correct frog face. So in fact, it has, it has more intelligence than you would, immediately, you would uh, initially assume because it has the ability to overcome a, a novel problem of being located in the wrong place that typical embryos don't have to deal with. So the genetics doesn't specify a hardware, uh, the hardwired rearrangements. It specifies a system that executes a, an error minimization, a way to, um, 
uh, to, to keep acting until you get to the correct state. So that raises an obvious question. How does it know what the correct target morphology is? And so, uh, th so, so this is the standard story uh, of developmental biology told in the textbook, which is that you have gene regulatory networks. Some of these genes make effector proteins that do things, so they're sticky or they, do, uh, they diffuse or they signal somehow. And then there's this proce process of emergence where, where lots of this happens in parallel and voila, at the end, you get some sort of complex outcome. And this is true, of course, there is this process of emergence of complex form from simple rules. Uh, but this isn't the whole story. There's a really important aspect to this, which, uh, which we study by uh, putting these feedback loops on here, which is that uh, when you deviate the system from its correct target morphology, and that could be large scale injury, it could be, uh, it could be aging, it could be um, teratogens or, or various other uh, mutations. What happens is there are loops that kick in, both in terms of physics and, and genetics. We're going to talk about the physics one that uh, try to get the system back to where it was. Okay, so this is this is the anatomical homeostasis part. Um, so now, if this is true, uh, the, well, the, this has a couple of uh, components. The it it you you may think, well, these are just feedback loops. Biologists know all about feedback loops. So there's feedback everywhere, and this is true. But the typical way of thinking about this, first of all, is it's um, something like, for example, a temperature control loop or a hunger a loop or a, or a pH regulation is uh, the set point is a scalar. It's a single number. This isn't the case. Here, you need a set point that in some to some level of detail uh, tells you what the correct shape is going to be. And um, uh, so, that's, so that's unusual. And the other thing is that, you know, typically in, in, in these kind of developmental molecular biology uh, approaches, when people don't like to think of any kind of a, of, of a final goal towards which the system is moving. It's supposed to be sort of uh, kind of this, this, this feed forward open loop kind of thing where whatever happens, happens, but there isn't a goal towards which it's going. And I, and I think that's fundamentally incorrect. It leaves a lot of useful things on the table to think about it that way. So uh, what we wanted to do was to, to, to follow the predictions of this kind of way of thinking about it. And, and it makes some very strong predictions. What it says is, if this is true, then there's going to be a target morphology encoded somewhere. It's going to have a physical uh, encoding somewhere, the way that um, you can find the encoding in your thermostat for where the set point is, is, is recorded. So it's going to be a, 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 an encoding of that. And what we'd be able to do is uh, learn to, to, to read it, to decode it, and thus to rewrite it. Because if we can do that, what that means is that you can change what happens out here by changing the set point, not just by controlling the genes and then hoping that uh, this process gets you what you want. Because working this backwards to ask, which genes do I edit to make specific changes here is incredibly difficult. It's a very hard inverse problem. It's what's going to limit applications of CRISPR and things like that. Uh, it's, it's very hard. So it would be much nicer if much like with your thermostat, you could change the set point and let the cells do what they do best, which is rebuild without you having to micromanage from the, from the lowest level. So, so, that's, so those are the um, uh, predictions. And this is what we've been working on for some, some years now. So I'm going to show you this. Uh, to, in order to start to think about how a collection of cells could store some sort of goal that it's going to move towards, we use the nervous system as a, as a source of inspiration, because it's very, uh, very clear that uh, there you have a great example of, of a system that can store goals and memories and, and work towards them. So how does it work? Well, uh, it, the hardware looks like this. Uh, it's, a, it's a network of cells, each of which has little ion channels um, that allow the, the cell to generate a voltage potential by segregating positive and negative charges. And those voltage potentials may or may not get propagated to neighboring cells via these regulated electrical synapses known as gap junctions. And so, so that's, how the, that's how the hardware looks. What that allows the networks to, to have is this very active electrical a set of uh, electrical processes. And here you can see it here, this is a zebrafish being, uh, this, this group made an amazing video of this uh, zebrafish while recording all the electrical activity as this animal is thinking about whatever it is that zebrafish think about. And the commitment of neuroscience is that uh, you should be able to do something they call neural decoding, which is that if we were to able to get all of these data, and if we understood how to decode them through these computer models, what we would be able to do is, is read out the contents of the animal's mind. What is it thinking about? What are the memories, the preferences, the behavioral repertoires? So the idea of neural decoding is that the information is literally encoded in the physiology. All of the uh, kind of cognitive aspects of this animal are encoded in these electrical signals. Well, it turns out, the amazing thing, it turns out that that kind of trick is ancient. It is not just something that is used for brains because 
uh, every cell in your body has ion channels. Most cells have gap junctions to their neighbors. And uh, it turns out that um, evolution uh, figured out the, the benefits of this kind of architecture, oh, back around the time of bacterial biofilms, uh, long before nerve and muscle came along. And so it turns out that these, these tricks that the nervous system uses are really based on uh, some of these very ancient ways to, uh, to process information in electrical networks. And so we thought, wouldn't it be remarkable if we took uh, a lot of concepts from uh, neuroscience and behavioral science, um, and this is, this is what it means to consider morphogenesis and intelligence. It's not just a metaphor of speaking. It's, 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 it's something that actually says, take seriously the, the um, isomorphism between these fields and take techniques from a completely different area that have never been applied to, uh, to, uh, to development, but the developmental biology and apply them to a different medium in a different problem space and see what these tools give, give you. And I, I think they give you a lot. And so that, that's how you cash out these, these, these claims uh, like, like, like that. And so what we decided to do was to say, okay, uh, could we use the same kind of tools to read all the electrical conversations that uh, body cells are having with each other? And from that extract or decode, uh, what, are, what are the anatomies that they're trying to build? What are their competencies and so on? And so, so we, we made uh, the first tools to read and write the electrical uh, information in cells outside of the nervous system. And so I'm gonna show you, show you these tools. I'm gonna show you what we can do with them. So this is a voltage sensitive fluorescent dye. And uh, this, uh, this allows us to non-invasively over time-lapse see what, um, what all the bioelectric patterns are. And then we can, we can do a lot of quantitative computer simulations to relate that to the different channels and pumps that are expressed and really gain an understanding of what the, what the physiological dynamics here. So here's an example of what, what you see when you do this. This is uh, a video of a frog embryo putting its face together. It's grayscale, but uh, that doesn't matter. Um, you can see it's quite, quite dynamic. But what you'll see here, we call this the electric face. This is, a, this is one frame of that movie. Um, it basically shows you that long before the, uh, the organs of the face are patterned and long before the uh, genes come on that, uh, that, that control some of these things, already this, this uh, anterior ectoderm has a, a, a map uh, uh, represented within it, this bioelectrical map of all the organs. So here's where the mouth is going to go. Here's where the eye is going to go. The placodes are to the side. Here's where everything is going to be. Um, so this is this is an endogenous uh, uh, pattern. And uh, I'll show you in a minute, it's actually required for normal face development. Whoops. Um, it's required for uh, the, uh, the, the morphogenesis that actually creates the face. If you interfere with this pattern, you, the gene expression will change and the anatomy will change. So that's a normal endogenous pattern. Here's a pathological pattern. What you can do is you can misexpress a human oncogene, and then uh, eventually you'll get a tumor. But before the tumor becomes apparent, you will already see that there are some uh, bioelectrical changes where these cells are basically uh, electrically disconnecting from their neighbors, and they're going to uh, go off on their own, and that's, uh, that's metastasis. And so um, and so, and so there's some obvious applications here of, to monitoring birth defects, to cancer diagnosis, and so on. Uh, but um, more, more important than, uh, than, the, than the characterization tools are the functional tools. So we don't use any applied fields. There are no frequencies, no waves, no electromagnetic radiation, no magnets. What we do is we control the native interface by which cells control each other. That is the electrical uh, set of electrical controls on their cell surface that they expose to each other. And the way we can do that is all the techniques of neuroscience. So we can target these electrical synapses to either open or close them. We can target all the ion channels uh, to change directly, not just the connectivity, but also the actual voltage states. And you can do this with drugs and you can do it with um, ion channel mutants and with optogenetics and, and various, other, various other techniques. And so we have the ability now to go in and, and with, with, with significant specificity to change which cell talks to which other cell and what voltage, in fact, they're, uh, they're, uh, they're communicating to each other, which corresponds to synaptic and intrinsic plasticity, um, res respectively. So uh, I'm going to show you an example, one of my favorite um, all-time examples, um, uh, originally discovered by my very first student back, uh, back at, uh, at when I was at Forsyth Institute at the Harvard Dental School. Um, we had, this, uh, we had this, this, this amazing finding, which is that uh, we decided to start to manipulate some of these voltages to ask what, what, what will happen. These were very early days. No one knew what was going to happen. In fact, people thought that voltage was a housekeeping parameter. Um, they said, well, if you mess with the voltage of these cells, they'll die. You'll get an uninterpretable phenotype. But we decided to try. And so, so what, what she did was to interpret 
uh, and the first person to see this uh, was Ivy Chen, and then uh, several other people in my group worked on this, uh, Sherry Ao and uh, Vai Puff Pai, more recently. And so, so what she did was to uh, inject RNA encoding a particular potassium channel into some cells that were going to be something other than I. And uh, what happens is that when you establish a little spot of voltage that is the same shape and, and, uh, and, and the voltage pattern as that I spot in the electric face I showed you, you can induce eyes anywhere else. You can get them on the gut, you can get them on the tail, you can put them anywhere anywhere um, on the animal. So, and, and these eyes will often have uh, the, uh, the, all the correct internal layers, so all the retina and um, optic nerve, all, all that stuff. So this tells you uh, four really interesting things. First is that the bioelectric pattern is instructive. Doesn't just, when you change that pattern, just doesn't just uh, screw up normal development. It's not permissive. It actually tells the cells, build an eye here. That's functionally what it does. Second is um, the amazing modularity. We didn't have to tell all the cells what, where the stem cells go, what the, how, how to build the lens, how to build the retina. We didn't have to do any of that. We, in fact, we have no idea how to do that. We couldn't possibly give it all the information how to build a whole complex eye. What we found is a very high level subroutine call that basically just says, build an eye here. The animal's uh, tissues already know how to build an eye. We found a trigger for it. So, so very modular and that's, and that's good for regenerative medicine. Um, also, what's remarkable is that if you probe this animal with uh, what, what was considered to be the uh, PAC6 master eye gene, only the anterior neurectorum, which is this tissue up here, is competent to be eye. And so in the developmental biology textbook, there's a story about ectodermal competency, and they tell you that only this these regions are competent to become eye. And that's true if you probe them with a PAC6 signal. But if you go upstream and probe this system with a voltage signal, in fact, all of them, you find out that all of the cells, including gut endoderm, which is really crazy, uh, are actually competent to make eye. And so the whole issue of how competent are these cells is, is really predicated on um, how, you, how you pose the question. And this has, this has direct implications for uh, prompting and AI and other, other kinds of systems. You, you have to have the right prompt to, to really learn what the system's capable of. Also, something else that's interesting, uh, this is a lens sitting out in the flank of a tadpole somewhere. Um, and uh, it, what, what you'll notice is these blue cells, this is beta galactosides, and these blue cells are the ones that we actually injected with the channel. All the rest of this was never directly injected by us. All these brown cells are native, unmanipulated cells. But what happened is that something that, something that happens in other collective intelligence is like ants. When a couple of ants come along, something they want to uh, move uh, and it's too big for them, they will recruit uh, their, their, uh, their, their neighbors. And so that's what happens here. These cells, so, so two levels of instruction. We instructed these cells that, hey, you need to make an eye. And these cells on their own, without us having to handle size control or how many cells there are or any of that, these cells uh, uh, commandeered and and um, uh, and and uh, hijacked their neighbors to participate with them in this in this project of constructing this lens because this system knows how big the thing is supposed to be. It knows how many of them there are, and it can do what's necessary. Which again, we had uh, we we didn't need to do this at all. This is a native competency scaling to the appropriate task is something tissues already do. So this goes back to my 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 claim that for proper regenerative medicine. You really want to be working with all of these competencies, these morphogenetic um, navigation tricks that uh, that the system has that are completely not obvious from standard development, and we need to be able to uh, exploit these. So, um, you so so doing that, you can do you can do uh, you can build many things. You can build you can ask the system to make ectopic four brain. So here's this giant brainy tadpole. You can make extra legs. So here's our six legged. Uh, six-legged frog. You can make extra hearts, um, extra beating hearts. You can make extra otocysts, which are inner ear um, organs, or you can ask it to make fins. Now that's interesting. Tadpoles aren't supposed to have fins. That's more of a more of a fish thing. We'll get to that um, in a minute. Um, but of course, now that once we saw that we were able to induce uh, complex uh, complex uh, uh, structures, we immediately started on a regenerative um, uh, kind of uh, medicine model, which is uh, leg regeneration. And so what we see in frogs. Frogs normally don't regenerate their legs, <clears throat> but what we see here is that if we uh, provide a cocktail with a specific ionophore that changes the voltage state of that wound cell, what we can do is we can trigger uh, immediately within, within a couple of days, you get this MSX1 positive uh, blastema marker and the leg immediately starts to grow. By 45 days, you've already got uh, some toes, you've got a toenail, and eventually you got a very nice leg that is touch sensitive and motile. This, um, by the way, uh, the stimulus here was only present for 24 hours. 
And if you stimulate for 24 hours in our most, most uh, recent paper, you get a year and a half of leg growth. And the whole point is that we aren't there 3D printing anything. We're not there with scaffolds or, or, or a control of gene expression or stem cells. We're not trying to tell the frog how to build the leg. We provide a very simple signal right at the beginning, which says, go towards the uh, leg building um, region of morphospace, not towards the scarring region. And that's it. After that, we don't, we don't touch it again. So again, relying, pushing all the complexity onto the system itself. Um, we are now uh, attempting to do this in, in mammals, in rodents, and uh, I have to do a disclosure here because David Kaplan and I are uh, scientific co-founders of a company called uh, Morphoceuticals Inc., which tries to apply this technology to get limb regeneration in uh, mammals and hopefully someday in the, in, into the clinic. Um, okay, I want to change gears and talk about a, a, a different organism. We're, we're back to planaria here. Uh, remember that uh, these guys can regenerate uh, uh, kind of uh, every, every part of their body. They're amazing. In, in particular, they also solve the aging problem. They're immortal. As far as we know, there's no such thing as an old planarian. They regenerate everything as it, as it uh, senesces. And uh, you've, got this, uh, you've got this amazing capacity. And so we wanted to answer a question. Uh, how, how does each piece know how many heads or tails it's supposed to have? It's kind of a funny question, but you know, if you're a piece like this, you have to know how many heads. And it's not, it's not obvious from where you were located because if you take a, um, uh, if you take a, a, a planarian and cut it in half, this region has to make a tail, this region has to make a head. They were direct neighbors. They were in the same location in the animal, but they have radically different anatomical outcomes. So it's not a trivial problem. You can't just tell what you're, what you're going to be based on where you were in the original. It doesn't work. So how do they know? So what we discovered was a bioelectric circuit, and I'll, I'll skip all the details, uh, that literally uh, controls uh, this, this process and stores the information about how many heads you're supposed to have. So the way it works is these, these single-headed planaria, and you can see the anterior is where the, the head markers are expressed, of course. And so when you cut them like this very reliably, you get a one-headed worm. But uh, what you can also do is, is cut these guys, again, one-headed animal, uh, uh, anterior gene expression in the right place in the head, not in the tail. And so you cut them and you get a two-headed worm. And why would this be a two, and this isn't Photoshop, these are, these are real animals. And why would you get a two-headed worm? I just told you that this is very uh, reliable. The reason is that we were able to find this bioelectrical pre-pattern that looks like this. And the decoding is kind of simple. I'm showing you this because much like with the electric face, this is the simple one. There are other patterns that are, that are very hard that we're still trying to crack. But what you can see is one head, one tail. And what we were able to do is use drugs to affect ion channels to change this pattern into two heads. And it's kind of messy, but, uh, but uh, it's okay, it works, two, two heads. And so uh, what you see here is, is that this two-headed um, uh, so two pattern gives rise to two-headed animals. But here's the amazing part. Uh, this is not a readout of this animal. This is a map of this animal. And this normally, uh, this, this, this anatomically and, and, and transcriptionally normal animal has a different representation of what a correct planarian looks like. And if you injure him, and not until then, so it's a latent memory, if you, if you injure him, then he, the cells will go ahead and they build what the pattern says, and then, then they will go ahead and they build two heads. But until that happens, it's a perfectly normal one-headed body. So uh, several, several interesting things here, one of which is that this, this bioelectric, again, of course, the bioelectric pattern is, is instructive. It tells you how many, uh, what, what, what kind of structures you're going to have. Second, um, remember that at the very beginning, I, I sort of uh, promised that we were going to find a, a, a read and decode and re-specify the pattern memories that allow a particular uh, set of tissues to, uh, to know what to build and when to stop. This is it. You're looking at it. The question, the question of how does the planarian piece know what to make? This is the answer. It's because this pattern contains the information that's needed to specify one aspect of its morphogenetic um, uh, future. And the other thing is that uh, this is this is perhaps the, the interesting thing is that again th this electrical pattern is is not a map of this animal. It's a map of this animal. So in an important sense, it's a counterfactual memory. It's a memory of what I, it's a it's a representation of what I will do in the future if I happen to be injured. So maybe this is an evolutionary precursor of that amazing mental time travel that, that the brains allow us to do, which is to uh, imagine or remember things that are not true right now, right? Things that happened in the past or things that are gonna happen in the future. This is the, perhaps this is the ancient somatic equivalent of that, um, of that process. So a single planarian body can store at least one of two different memories of what a correct planarian should look like. 
So it's, it's reprogrammable in an important sense, just like learning in the brain and just like our computer technology, the same hardware can store different types of uh, information. And why do I keep calling it a memory? Because uh, if we take these two headed animals and we um, cut off the primary head and we cut off this ectopic secondary head, with no more manipulation, you, you might think that, well, the genetics are untouched. You didn't edit the genome. There's nothing wrong with the genetics. So if you get rid of this, this, this crazy secondary head, maybe the cells will just rebuild the normal planarian. But that's not at all what they do. If you, if, you, if you cut them again, they will continue to make two heads in perpetuity. And um, this, this, has, this has all the properties of memory. It's long-term stable. It's rewritable because we can shift back and forth. We know how to make two heads from one, and we can actually take these two-headed guys and, and put them back to being one-headed. It has conditional recall, meaning it can store the memory until it actually gets injured, and it has two discrete possible behaviors. And here you can see this this uh, this video. You can see what um, what these two-headed animals um, are are like. Um, and uh, you know the the, fir the first two-headed uh, planaria were reported in the early 1900s, uh, but it wasn't until 2008. Um, that uh, uh, my student Larissa Wozniak first, I had asked her to recut these things. No, nobody ever recut them, uh, to my knowledge. Um, you know, it, because it was assumed that once you get rid of that extra structure, the gene, the genetics are normal. Of course, it should go back to normal, which is, you know it was, it was assumed. So it's it's really critical to um, uh, uh, to 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 think in in, in broader directions that that uh, uh, kind of un uncover these novel uh, capabilities of of, of tissues. And uh, what we're doing now is is uh, is all kinds of uh, uh, computational modeling to try to merge what we know about the bioelectric state of the circuit here, where it has this these attractors, one head, two head, and so on, with uh, what um, connectionist um, uh, uh, machine learning is telling us about ways in which net networks can store information and can recover uh, the entire information from partial or damaged. Uh, pieces and so there's a I think there's a great unification to be done here and this this uh, this paper talks about that. Ah, but it is not just about uh, head number. It's also about head shape. So the amazing thing is that uh, if I take this, uh, this, uh, this triangular shaped planarian, cut off his head, perturb the electrical pattern in a particular way, let them then, then take the reagent away, let them settle down. Sometimes they settle back to a nice triangular shape like they should, or they sometimes give you a round head like this S Mediterranea or a flat head like this P Felina. And so uh, the, the, these animals are about um, 150 to 100 million years in evolutionary distance. And uh, not only does the head shape change, but um, all the uh, internal components, the stem cells, the, the, the shape of the brain become just like these other species. So you can ask this hardware to visit uh, attractors in that morphospace space that typically belong to other species. These species go there by default, but this species can be pushed to navigate space in that way if um, if the navigation policies, which are encoded by the bioelectrics, are changed in the, in the in the right way, so the hardware is perfectly willing to visit these other um, these other um, attractors. In fact, you can go uh, and uh, and and visit shapes that uh, don't look like planary at all. So you can make this crazy spiky form. You can make uh, these cylindrical things. You can make sort of hybrids. It's uh, it's it's uh, what Darcy Thompson was was talking about in his uh, in his classic. Where, where he showed these kind of um, uh, deformations, a kind of nowadays you would call it a kind of a latent morphospace of possible shapes and, and have you know, real, real animals be, be the result of deformations of a, of a coordinate grid. And there are all these other possibilities besides the standard default that we see all the time. So um, of course, what we're, what we're trying to do is, is put together a full stack computational model that goes from the molecular biology of which channels and pumps are expressed to the tissue uh, level electrophysiology and, and all the voltage uh, patterns to the organ level stable patterns that eventually can be interpreted uh, by humans and by AI as uh, an algorithm about what every piece is going to build. And here's where you want to do your interventions. It's very hard to do them down here. And not methodologically, of course, but, but, but conceptually, it's hard to know what to do. But up here, it, it starts to get very obvious. And so we're trying to forge that, um, forge that link because we have, we have simulators of bioelectrics and so on. So um, the last story uh, I, I want to tell you about uh, kind of uh, this, this, this uh, part of the talk has to do with how, how this is going to play out on regenerative medicine. So here's, a, here's an example. Uh, this is a typical uh, tadpole brain, and you can see very nice forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain, uh, left and right um, halves. 
And there are a variety of, of, of defects you can induce with, with uh, teratogens such as nicotine and alcohol and, and mutations and so on that really wreck this, this structure. So here, um, the forebrain is basically gone. The, the eyes are connected directly to the, to the midbrain, um, real, really problematic. And so, so, so we wanted to develop a proof of concept of using what we've learned about the bioelectrics here to, uh, to repair this, to find uh, interventions that repair these very complex birth defects. We don't have a hope of talking to each individual cell and controlling where all the stem cells go and what the pattern is. And uh, I don't think in our lifetime that's, that's going to happen, but we thought, could we, could we find uh, high level controls that let us uh, leverage the competencies of, these, of this system? So what we did was, uh, was um, and this is the work of uh, Alexis Pytak with uh, Vipoff Pi in the lab, and so what they did was create, uh, uh, she, she made a computer model of what the bioelectric pattern um, normally should be and how it gets altered by these various treatments. And then uh, Pi was able to um, do the biology and do the following thing, to ask the model, if the pattern is incorrect, what channels would I need to open or close to make the bioelectric pattern correct? Not going to worry about what happens downstream, not going to worry about what, whatever the, the gene expressions are that are induced by this, but how do I fix the bioelectric pattern? So um, what I'm showing you here is perhaps the most uh, uh, kind of uh, the most amazing example, which is uh, never mind the chemical uh, teratogens. Let's let's look at a mutation. So this is a mutation in a gene called Notch, introduced into it's a dominant uh, active mutation introduced into these animals. Their brains are completely wrecked as a result of this. It's a very important neurogenesis gene. Forebrain is gone. Midbrain and hindbrain are a bubble. These animals lay there, no behavior, you know, which is just profound, uh, profoundly defective. And so the model said something very interesting. It said there's this there's this HCN2 channel, which kind of has this special property. And um, what it will do is it's predicted to sharpen gradients. So it's like a like a sharpen filter in Photoshop. It basically it basically um, uh, makes makes very sharp bi bioelectrical boundaries between compartments that are not differing by enough voltage. And so what we did was find out that whether by expressing more of this channel or by drugs, in fact, two already approved human anti-epileptics that opened up this channel, uh, the model predicted that, that 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 would fix it. And it was kind of an amazing, uh, you know, it's, it's a shocking prediction. We tried it and sure enough, uh, incredi incredibly enough, uh, even though this animal has the mutation, the brain is normal, the gene expression is normal and their learning rates are indistinguishable from controls. And so, I'm not claiming that uh, all genetic defects are going to be fixable this way. There will be many things like missing enzymes and things like that that are not going to be fixable this way. But at least some uh, hard, hardware defects, I mean, this is an actual mutation in a, in a signaling pathway, some hardware defects can be repaired in software by a transient stimulation of a drug that was chosen by a computer model. So we've gone from uh, the very initial early work in, uh, let's say, around 2000, where we were just probing the space of possibilities, you know, what does the, what do the bioelectrics control, down to now, to the point where uh, we are in, 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 well, already in 2018, we were able to use a computer model to pick a drug for a very complex uh, vertebrate birth defect and, um, and repair it. And so, so um, the way that uh, the therapeutics is going to look is 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 basically like this, and there's already you can sort of play around with with an early version of it here. Uh, you you will you'll pick some some tissues that you're interested in, and uh, what we need is to know the correct bioelectric state of that organ or tissue, and then you'll know what the incorrect state is. And then there's going to be a computational platform that's going to um, uh, electroceutical design environment. Uh, this stands for it, and what it's going to do is. Uh, help you choose uh, uh, correct channels that, that will need to be open or closed to correct the pattern. And from there, it's very simple to find drugs that will target that channel. And so, uh, then, and so, and so that that's how that's how this is going to work. Um, and so, uh, kind of uh, the last thing I want to say about uh, about this uh, this this uh, this part of the talk is that uh, if we think about the whole space of bioelectric biomedical in interventions. The vast majority of efforts today go under this bottom-up category. So the hardware uh, uh, repairs, uh, surgery, transplants, uh, stem cell implants, genomic editing, um, re rewiring gene regulatory networks, and so on, all, all of these things are focused on the hardware. And we, and we all know some of the deficiencies uh, and limitations. So, so we have very few things, very few treatments that actually fix anything. Many things, once you stop taking the drug, uh, everything goes right back or actually gets worse because it was, it was uh, uh, targeted at the, at the symptoms. It wasn't actually fixing the fundamental issue. Um, and of course, we have great variability across patients. We have uh, lots of side effects. 
and uh, and and this is this is to be expected when when trying to control a complex system bottom up. Uh, but but there are there are complementary techniques that we can use having to do with first of all uh, I didn't have time to talk about any of this but there there's lots of interesting applications in actually training cells and tissues and in fact molecular networks so using stimuli rewards and punishments and so on to act, to make long term lasting changes by exploiting the memory capacity of of, of all of these levels and in, and of course uh, what we've been talking about now which is which is uh, the whole field of morphoceuticals which has within it. Um, ways to target the decision-making machinery, the, the, the morphogenetic machinery that it uses mechanical, uh, chemical, and of course, electrical modalities. And so this is all, all the electroceuticals are down here with ion channel drugs and optogenetics and so on. And, and lots of lots more um, is discussed here. And I, I think, um, just to, to speculate a little bit, I think that future, uh, future medicine is going to look a lot less like chemistry and a lot more like a kind of somatic psychiatry. Where you're going to take very seriously the the memories, the the, the preferences, the uh, uh, competencies of the body, cells, tissues, and organs, and try to uh, leverage those competencies by um, not trying to micromanage their behavior, but trying to give them signals. And so, bioelectricity is a really critical interface that normally uh, mediates between high-level cognitive information down to molecular. Uh, uh, properties and 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 if that sounds weird to you, just think about how you get up out of bed in the morning. When you when you wake up and you decide that you need to go to bed, uh, that you need to get out of bed rather and go to work, um, what's happening here is that your high level cognitive intent that that uh, knows what work is and all the consequences of, of of doing it or not doing it, all of that has to has to filter down to the molecular events at your at your muscle cells to enable you to get up out of bed. So, so your cognitive intent of, of, of wanting to do something changes the way that molecules interact in your muscles. And so all of that, that, that transduction from, 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 from cognition to, to molecular biology is done by bioelectrics. All of that is electrical. And I think we can hack this for, for the rest of the body for some really um, transformative health applications. So the last thing I want to do just for a couple of minutes um, is to... Um, uh, broaden out a little bit into into two other uh, quick uh, quick uh, mentions. One is uh, this idea of uh, let, let's let's just talk about cancer for a second. So so this is what uh, this is what we're made of and what evolution uh, individual cells. And so what evolution has has uh, g given us is some hardware that allows cells which normally work on little tiny goals. So 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 little tiny metabolic and proliferative goals of single cells to a very grandiose large scale morphogenetic goals like we're going to work together to build this limb and if that's uh, inhibited uh, temporarily then we're going to do it again and, and and build it again so these are very high level goals that these cells are going after but that process can break down and when that process breaks down this is what we call cancer so these are human glioblastoma cells and what happens is that if you dissociate cells electrically from uh, each other they will basically revert back to their unicellular uh, past. They will act like amoebas. And at that point, the rest of the animal is just, the rest of the body uh, is just external environment to them. So they're not any more selfish than somatic cells. It's just that their selves are smaller. So the boundary between self and world, here the boundary is out here, it's huge. This, you know, this, this, this whole thing acts as a unit to, to achieve a particular morphogenetic trajectory. Um, but, but once you disconnect the cells, they don't do that anymore. Now, now all, all, all they, all they have is little tiny goals uh, that stop at the roughly at the cell surface. So, so one, uh, so now that's kind of a weird way of thinking about things. But as always, it has practical consequences, which is that if you think this way, then then you might uh, take take this hypothesis that if we put human oncogenes into this tadpole, we know it's going to make a tumor. Um, but what we'll do, we're not going to kill those cells with chemotherapy, and we're not going to try to uh, fix the mutation. What we're going to do is simply force them to remain bioelectrically connected to their neighbors, even though they have the mutation. And so we've done this now with with um, with glee and with with uh, uh, nasty uh, um, yeah, KRAS mutations. Uh, here, it's the, the the oncogene is marked in red. You can see that there's this tumor uh, here. Uh, there's this uh, a very very strong. Uh, Low, um, uh, expression of this oncogene. In fact, it's all over the place in the body, but there is no tumor here. This is the same animal. Because even though the oncogene is blazingly strongly expressed, if the cells are electrically connected to the rest of them, what they do is participate in normal organogenesis, not, uh, not crawl around and, and metastasize. So this is, um, this is a way of taking some of these ideas about the, the, the shifting boundary between self and world and put it into a practical um, application. And of course, um, 
we're, we're pursuing this now in, in, uh, in, in human uh, glioblastoma and, and some other things. Okay, the very last, uh, I'm just gonna take uh, uh, about uh, four or five minutes here just to give you a, a kind of a last uh, piece. And um, I have to do a, another disclosure here. Uh, Fauna Systems is a company that um, Josh Bongard and I have, have started around uh, computer design biorobotics. And, I, and the idea was this, uh, I, I've, tried to, I've tried to make the point that morphogenesis is a navigation of anatomical space by a kind of uh, system that remembers where it's going and it has certain uh, navigation policies and it has certain capabilities of getting there despite some number of things that can happen to it. Um, but if we if we ask the question in a in a typical uh, animal, um, where where do those memories come from? In, in other words, what determines the the, the shape of that space? Uh, and the, and, the, and and fundamentally the anatomy of the of the of the, and the and the and the of the, uh, the behavior of that animal. Uh, typically, the answer is well, evolution. So so years of selection have shaped that space, and now and now this is the you know this is the morphology that that survives in the real world. And so one, we wanted to ask this question about plasticity. We said if if we take these cells with a standard genome um, and give them a chance to reboot their multicellularity. What will they build? Like, what is the what is the um, the structure of the of the um, morphous space for creatures that have never existed before? And so, this is where synthetic biology, or better yet, synthetic morphology, comes in, because we can make some creatures that have never been here on Earth in that in that um, particular embodiment, and we can ask what do their shapes look like. So here's um uh, here's an example. Uh, what happens is. Uh, we take a frog embryo, and this is uh, all the biology here is work, the work of Doug Blackiston, and this is a collaboration with Josh Bongard's uh, lab. Um, and uh, Sam Creedman was a student who did a lot of the, com the computational work. Uh, what happens is we can we can take off some of the ectodermal skin cells from this embryo, and we we, we dissociate them and we put them aside in this in this uh, set, set them aside, and they can do many things. They could they could die. They could spread out and leave, uh, you know, go away from each other. They could form a two-dimensional flat uh, monolayer like a cell culture. What they do instead is um, they actually, they get together, and this is time-lapse, they, they get together and they make something very interesting, which looks like this. Um, the flashing is uh, calcium signaling. Uh, so what they make is something we call a xenobot. Um, why xenobot, uh, why xenobot? Xenopus lavis is the name of the frog. Um, I think it's a biorobotics platform, so that's why it's a it's a xenobot. Uh, first of all, they swim um, and they use little uh, hairs on their cell surface um, on their uh, outer surface called cilia. These are normally used by the frog to move mucus down the body down its body to keep the um, pathogens away. But they're using it to swim. They can go in circles. They can sort of patrol back and forth like this. They can have all kinds of interesting uh, collective and group behaviors that you can see some tracking data here. Um, they change their movements as a function of time. They sort of wander around doing various things. Um, here's one uh, doing a maze. So you can see here it swims uh, forward. It's going to take this corner without bumping into the opposite wall. So uh, it doesn't just go straight until it hits something. It can take that corner. And here it shows uh, some, some kind of primitive initiative and uh, spontaneously turning around and going back where it came from. So these are not pul these are not stimulated. Uh, these are not um, actuated in by us in any way, unlike uh, some of the current um, uh, biorobotics that exist. The com completely um, completely spontaneous. Um, they have uh, if 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 we if we track the calcium signaling like we did in that zebrafish, um, uh, like that uh, other other lab did in that zebrafish uh, that I showed you earlier, you can see that it's, they're, they're very active. There's no neurons in here. But the but the it's just skin. But the but the skin cells are are, are very active, and we are now applying all sorts of um, information theory tools to ask uh, if we can decode what the cells are saying to each other, what two xenobots might be saying to each other, and so on. Um, they regenerate. So if you cut it almost in half, it'll seal up like this. So so from from here, they will um, uh, they will uh, they will they will uh, seal themselves. And um, perhaps the most amazing thing we discovered by uh, by the simulations that um, Sam um, and uh, and Josh uh, Josh did was that in their movements they tend to um, they tend to have a very peculiar effect on on their environment and so so you know uh, they they built this amazing simulator where we could Doug could actually build various types of xenobots corresponding to shapes that uh, that that the that the AI was suggesting and what we found is this if you give them uh, loose skin cells in their environment. What they do is uh, they implement um, von Neumann's dream, which is a robot that would go out and build copies of itself from uh, materials it found in the environment. Um, 
because uh, we've made it impossible for these guys to reproduce themselves. You know, they, they're, they're just skin. They don't have all the other organs you need for frog style reproduction. But within a couple of days, they uh, figure out a new way to make copies of themselves. And so what they do is they, by their movements, they collect these skin cells into a little ball and they sort of polish and, and compact the ball. And because they're working with a an agential material like us, we, we were only able to make xenobots because we were working with, with skin cells that have certain competencies. They have the same advantage. And so because it's an agential material, they make the next generation of bots. And when these xenobots mature, guess what they do? They run around and they do exactly the same thing. And that gives you the next generation of bots and the next generation. So this is kinematic self-replication. To our knowledge, doesn't uh, no other uh, organism on earth does this. Uh, brand new, brand new kind of thing. Um, and so, and so this brings us uh, kind of uh, to almost the end of the story, where one thing you can ask is, what did the frog genome learn through all, all these, uh, you know, so eons of, of evolution? Well, it certainly learned to make a frog, and it learned this developmental sequence that leads through this stereotypical stages, and then some tadpoles with, with behavior. But that's not the only thing it makes. It can also make xenobots with a completely different developmental sequence. This is, this is a couple month old Xenobot. I have no, no idea what this thing's trying to become. And they have different behaviors, including kinematic self-replication that, uh, that uh, has never existed before. So um, we don't know, by the way, um, what their behavioral repertoires are like. Do they, can they learn? Uh, what do they have preferences? All of that is currently under active investigation. But uh, at least in, in the case of the morphology, we can say a few things. We can say that, uh, there have never been any xenobots. There's never been selection to be a good xenobot. So this whole a lifestyle and capabilities and everything else cannot be a straight, you, you can't tell a straightforward uh, selectionist uh, story about it. Um, where does it come from? That's an interesting uh, thing we can, we can discuss. And uh, what it looks to me like from this and, and many other experiments is that evolution doesn't give you just solutions to specific problems. What evolution makes is problem solving machines. And under uh, um, default environments, they always produce the same outcome. And it sort of de development sort of lulls us into a, a, a false um, a sense that we understand what the system can do. And evolution gives us a, an easy way to, uh, to sort of to, to explain uh, why we see what we see. But there's actually a lot more plasticity and capability that doesn't appear until you probe the intelligence of the system by putting it in a new environment where it has to do new things. And in particular, we didn't engineer this by changing the genome. We didn't put in any new uh, circuits. The DNA is exactly the same. We didn't put any weird nanomaterials. The only thing we did is liberate these cells from the rest of the embryo that normally uh, basically uh, um, um, uh, force them into having a kind of boring two-dimensional life on the outside of the organism, keeping out the bacteria. That's it. When you take them away from, it's, it's in this case, it's engineering by subtraction, by liberation. When we take these cells away from these other instructive signals, then you find out what their baseline preference is. Their baseline is, is this, to have a much more exciting life as a, as a xenobot. Um, and so, so I, I'm sure there are many, many of these things out there in, uh, in the world that we simply um, don't know about yet. And so uh, what I think the xenobot really is, I mean, yes, it's a biorobotics platform and there will be useful synthetic living machines and, and, and so on. But what I think it really is, and the xenobot isn't just, uh, you know, to be clear, the xenobot isn't just this thing. The xenobot is this thing plus the AI that was used to uh, to to um, investigate it, the human uh, engineers that that prompted these cells to do this, that whole thing is is really the Xenobot. And what it really is, is um, an unusual uh, novel tool. It's an exploration tool for uh, probing these uh, these uh, these morphous spaces, these other latent spaces that we're not very good at at noticing. And um, and what I think is that um, when Darwin said endless forms most beautiful, he was I'm kind of amazed at all the diversity of life. All of that natural life is this tiny little corner of morphous space that's formed by, by the space of possible bodies and minds that's formed by every possible combination of evolved material, cells, DNA, tissues, uh, designed material, you know, sp smart materials, implants, and all, and all that, and software. Life is incredibly interoperable, and every combination of, of these three things is probably going to be some kind of viable being that's uh, yeah, hybrids and cyborgs. And, and, and some of these all already exist, of course, and, and many more will. And you know, for, the, for the younger people in the audience, in your lifetime, you are going to be surrounded by other agents that are nowhere on the tree of life with you. You cannot decide how to relate to them based on where they are on the standard 
n equals one tree of life on earth. So, so we are going to have to, this I think is really critical, uh, the Xenobots is just the first uh, kind of uh, a small step in this direction. We are going to have to develop a new kind of ethics for relating to truly diverse intelligences that don't look like you. They don't share. Uh, they don't share um, uh, uh, our our, uh, our evolutionary history, and uh, you know uh, a, a different a different way to relate to beings, not based on uh, what do you look like, what are you made of, and how did you get here. Meaning, uh, evolved versus engineered. So um, uh, just I'll, I'll summarize the whole thing by saying that I think one of the most interesting things in biology is that um, all of all intelligence is collective intelligence functioning through this multi-scale competency architecture that navigates various virtual spaces. Um, this kind of goal directedness, the cybernetic kind, not the um, not the mystical kind, is uh, uh, really an invariant for recognizing, building, and relating to very unconventional agents. Um, and and uh, there's a lot more about the, this, this, this cognitive uh, boundary that we can talk about. And the collective intelligence of cells is really an excellent uh, target for regenerative medicine and also as an example of why this kind of approach, it's not philosophy and it's not uh, metaphors. It's, it's something that, that actively uh, on, a, on a, you know, every year it generates novel discoveries and new capabilities that we didn't have before. And um, just that, that, that's, that, that exploring these spaces provides an astronomically large a possibility for new bodies and new minds, which has huge implications, not just for um, biomedicine and robotics, but understanding evolution, understanding ourselves, ethics, and so on. So um, if anybody's interested in going deeper, um, lots of these papers uh, have uh, discussed this stuff in, in great detail. I want to thank um, the students and postdocs who did, um, who did all the work. Uh, lots of lots of uh, technical support. Um, 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 some of our amazing collaborators, uh, our funders um, here, um, Jeremy Gay of Peregrine Creative does all the um, illustrations, um, and uh, most of all uh, the various model systems because the animals do um, all the heavy lifting. So um, I will thank you uh, for listening and take questions. Thank you, Dr. Levin. That was fantastic. Um, and I want to thank you on behalf of the society and the students and uh, guests who are um, joining us today to listen. Um, and I thank you for taking uh, just a couple extra minutes to um, answer a few questions. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, I'm going to paraphrase uh, some that came in on the uh, Q&A forum. Um, one, there's often a concern when there's new breakthroughs in um, medicine that the uh, new treatments are only going to be available to the rich, that there's going to be an inequity problem. Um, and I'm kind of intuiting what the answer is going to be, but uh, is there a potential here to have a solution that can be more um, widely adapted because of the form that it takes? Yeah, yeah, there is. I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll say first that I, I'm not an expert in the uh, economics of medicine. As far as I understand, uh, we have an inequity problem with water. And so, you, you know, it doesn't have to be some fancy therapeutics before you get into a, an inequity problem. So, so that, that's all, that's the you know, kind of baseline. Um, but with this, with this specific uh, set of manipulations, yeah, I actually think it has an extremely favorable um, equity profile because um, it, we, we, are, we are explicitly not doing the thing that's done now, which is heroic interventions at the very end of life to try to prolong basically a sinking ship and and that and what that means is that the input to the next stage is 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 way more um you know sort of uh, uh degraded and that means that the next step has to be more expensive and heroic what we are saying is maybe there's a way to trigger regeneration like in planaria or like in salamanders and uh and do it uh at the whole you know during during the whole uh life uh, life of the of the individual um increase in the health span and in particular just about everything we do is uh, can be done with very uh, cheap ion channel drugs. So these are uh, many of them already human approved. Most of them are, are off patent. This is uh, for, as, as far as interventions go. This is this is uh, this is the delivery is going to be very cheap. What's super expensive right now is uh, the R and D. Right. So 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 building all the equipment, building all that. I mean, none of this existed before. All the software, everything else, everything has to be built. Once we crack this, I mean, I call this cracking the, the morphogenetic code. Once we crack this, uh, the actual treatments are going to be way cheaper than anything we've seen. Fantastic. Um, and uh, just maybe quickly, this uh, one question, because I think it's going to be on the minds of many people. We have, um, you know, a common intuitive end that a lot of our um, uh, minds go when we think about um, 
intelligence in other ways beyond um, the standard that we imagine that we have. Um, and that is, you know, creating intelligence in um, silicon as opposed to in um, our uh, biology. Um, and uh, the question is, um, what is, is there something that limits the ability of taking our understanding of the hardware software relationship that you're uncovering and transferring essentially ourselves into our, our goals, our memories into the silicon space? Yeah, um, are you are you asking about uh, creating novel uh, novel agents in silicon, or are you asking uh, what happens? Or are you talking about the idea of of taking an existing person and implementing them? And is that that latter thing? It's the second. That was the question. Essentially, prolonging your um, your mind's existence in a computer. Yeah. Well, look, uh, I mean, this is this is really a, a, an, an old philosophical thing. Let, let, imagine imagine for a minute that. Um, uh that uh this uh the the the, the whole uh, uh you know kind of star trek transporter thing was solved and they would basically say well we're just gonna we're gonna record a copy of you when you're when you're gonna record you when you're young and then when you get old uh we're just gonna you know beam down a copy and and he'll be you know you'll be young again and, and all great so okay, there's there's a couple of ways to think about this one way to think about it will be uh well fantastic uh there's going to be a young me running around on earth like great they'll bring it on Another way of thinking is, okay, you're basically going to make a time shift to twin, and that's great. But I'm still here, aging and dying. That's what, what good does it do me? Uh, you know, what, what good do the copies do me? So, I think that it's it's not an issue of technology. It's an issue of what do we really what do we really value? And the question is, if if there is a you know you 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 I mean I, I don't think the technology is going to be remotely there in in our relevant uh, time frame to to make a copy of us in any way. But but let's say you could. I mean, ultimately, I don't see why it's impossible. But but we're we're not able to do it for a long time. Uh, but if you know that you you flip the computer on and he says, oh, fantastic, it's it's great in here, and you say, yeah, well, good good for you, I guess. But what do I do? So I, I'm not sure that that actually solves the the problem, but it's fun to think about. Fair point. Um, uh, and that's all the time of yours that we're going to take. Um, I know that you have another engagement that you need to be getting to. Um, but uh, if everyone, um, you know, in your own private corner of the universe will uh, join me in giving Dr. Levin a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And anybody that's interested, drop me an email. Um, I saw a couple other questions I haven't gotten to. So anybody that wants to know anything, drop me an email. Thank you so much for that. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And thank you, Dr. Levin, again. Thank you so much, Dr. Levin. And thank you so much, Dr. Krasnow, for being here. Bye, everybody.